Hey, welcome back for more fun with Spinoza. So in the last lecture, we got through proposition number five, uh, or I left you hanging with proposition number five. So that's what we're going to pick up today. Um, I'm going to do these in briefer uh, lecture stints. So you can watch one for 10 minutes, think about it a little bit, watch another one for 10 minutes. So let's get right into it. So what I need to do here is switch over to proposition number five. So remember, proposition number five indicates that in the universe there cannot be two or more substances of the same nature or attribute. And here's his proof. If there were several such substances, they would have to be distinguished from one another, either by a difference of attributes or by a difference of affections, properties, qualities, modes, right? So what we perceive of substances are either their essence or their modes or their properties or their qualities. So he continues, if they are distinguished only by a difference of attributes, then it will be granted that there cannot be more than one substance of the same attribute. So let's think about that for a second. If we have two physical things, two bodies, right? How do we distinguish between the two? Insofar as they are bodies, they are identical. There's no distinguishing mark that allows us to s separate them, the one from the other. But, you respond, Right? This body has properties that this body doesn't have. That's how we distinguish between the two. And so Spinoza goes on to say, if they are distinguished by a difference of affections, qualities, properties, modes, then since substance is by nature prior to its affections, disregarding therefore its affections and considering substance in itself, it cannot be conceived as distinguishable from another substance. That is, there cannot be several such substances, but only one. So we say, look, go on to the next slide here. Look, I have two bodies, and sure, they can't be distinguished qua body, insofar as they are two bodies, they are just one body. We can say the same thing, right? Okay. That body is perceived as extended, right? That's its attribute. Okay. But, but our response was, yeah, but this body is of this shape and this body is of this other shape. But remember, Spinoza argues, the shape, the mode, is ontologically and logically dependent upon the attribute. So his thought is that modes simply collapse into attributes. We can't distinguish between two substances with the same attribute, and neither can we distinguish between two substances, even if they have different modes, because those modes collapse into um, the attribute. So he concludes, there cannot be several such substances, but only one. So this leads to the conclusion that there can at most be one extended material substance and at most one thinking substance. Now Descartes actually agrees with the first part of this. He didn't talk about this, but Descartes himself believes that there is only one material substance on grounds quite similar to Spinoza's. Okay. But Descartes, of course, thinks that there are many thinking substances, one for each of us. So here is one of those places where Spinoza has left uh, Descartes behind. He thinks there can be at most one extended physical substance and at most one thinking substance. There cannot be two or more substances of the same nature or attribute. And we can move on to Proposition 6. So Proposition 6 says one substance cannot be produced by another substance. This is largely, seeing this is largely a matter of just putting all these little pieces together that we've been talking about for the last couple of lectures, right? So he just proved that there cannot be two substances of the same attribute, right? That is, 
to say there can't be two substances that have something in common, right? They have different attributes, they have nothing in common. So, one cannot be the cause of the other. That is, one cannot be produced by the other. And then he gives us a corollary in the second proof. So he says, hence it follows that substance cannot be produced by anything else. For in the substance there exists nothing but substances and their affections. But it cannot be produced by another substance. Therefore, substance cannot be produced by anything whatsoever. Substances cannot come into existence. That's going to lead us directly into Proposition 7 and 8. He says, This can be proved even more readily by the absurdity of the contradictory. For if substance could be produced by something else, the knowledge of substance would have to depend on the knowledge of its cause, and so it would not be a substance at all. You can work through that one on your own. So let's move on. All right. So basically, he said, one substance cannot cause another to exist, but they do exist, right? We know that they do exist, so it follows that it must be the case that existence belongs to the very nature of substance. Yeah, existence belongs to the very nature of substance. It is a kausasui. It is self-caused. Remember, what that means is that its essence necessarily involves existence. Existence belongs to its very nature. Right? So we now know that there are at most, there is at most one physical substance, and at most one thinking substance, and that each of these are kausasui, each of these are self-caused, each of these exists necessarily, each of these, its essence entails its existence. What it is entails that it is. And then we can move on to the next proposition. Every substance is necessarily infinite. There cannot be more than one substance having the same attribute. We prove that in Proposition 5. And existence belongs to the nature of substance, Proposition 7. Substance, therefore, must either exist as finite or infinite. But it can't exist as finite, because then it would have to be limited by another substance of the same nature, and that substance also would have to exist. And so there would exist two substances of the same attribute, which is absurd. Therefore, it exists as infinite. So notice the structure of this argument. Right? He's basically arguing the substance, this necessarily existing substance, is either finite or infinite. It's not finite. It can't be finite. Therefore, it must be infinite. Well, why can't it be finite? Well, to say that something is finite is to say that it is limited. And remember the definition of finite after its kind. It would have to be limited by something of the same nature as it. Right? A, something larger, right, or vaster than it. But that would entail that there be two substances. And we've demonstrated that there cannot be two substances of the same attribute. There can only be one. Therefore, substance cannot be finite. It must be infinite. Yeah? How's it going? All right. Let's go one more here. The more reality a thing has, or being a thing has, the more attributes it has. Right? This is, he says, evident from the definition of an attribute. So the more reality a thing has, the more attributes it has, the more essences it has. And then Proposition 10. Each attribute of one substance must be conceived through itself. An attribute is that which intellect perceives of a substance as constituting its essence. And so it has to be conceived through itself, by definition, right? Now, this is a puzzling one. But it becomes clear in his scolium to this proposition what, in fact, this, he, he sees this as entailing. So this is significant because it entails that 
An absolutely infinite entity must necessarily def be defined as an entity consisting of infinite attributes, each of which expresses a definite essence, eternal and infinite. Right? So an infinite entity must have an, an infinite number of attributes. Yep. Okay. Just as an aside, a scolium, scolia, are things written in the margins. Uh, in ancient texts, often written in the margins by someone who is commentating on the text. Uh, Spinoza, however, is commenting on his own text. Right? So he often has scolia do his propositions. All right. So at this point, I think you can probably see where we're going. But there are a couple of steps to go. And I'm going to pause here, I think. Yeah. So can you anticipate where he's going? What are we going to show in the next few steps? So we now know that there can be at most one substance of each sort, of each attribute. But we also know that there's an absolutely infinite being, substance, which possesses an infinite number of attributes. How can these be reconciled? We also know that substance exists necessarily, that substance's essence entails its existence. So if we put all these pieces together, where do we end up? And that's where we will pick up in the next video.